Hello everyone and welcome to the book launch for the second edition of this uh, book here, Ireland, Republicanism and Revolution. Um, it's a real pleasure to be launching the book, uh, or the new edition of the book today. My name is Ben Glinietzky and I'm an activist with Socialist Appeal, which is a Marxist organisation in Britain. Um, as well as everybody here in the room, we're joined by uh, several dozen or dozens of people on the Zoom call as well from around the world. So I think we've got people tuning in from the US, Canada, Sweden, and Ireland, of course, uh, and watching the book launch today. Now, the author of the book is Alan Woods, uh, the editor of Marxist.com. He is unfortunately not able to be here tonight, uh, but he has sent me a, a me he has sent a message to the meeting, and he's asked me to read it out, so I'll, I will do that now. Alan says, Dear comrades, the publication of a new edition of my book on Ireland is a source of great pride and joy to me. And it is a matter of great regret that for reasons beyond my control, I'm unable to be with you on this important occasion. But I take this opportunity to send my most enthusiastic greetings to your meeting. My message is a simple one. None of the problems facing the working class and the youth can be solved under capitalism. This is the fundamental fact which we must grasp. The tragic history of Ireland, which I've attempted to outline in my book, provides ample proof of this. That history is filled with examples of the heroism of the Irish working class and the cowardice, duplicity and treachery of the Irish bourgeoisie and their petty bourgeois hangers-on. The last named always posed the national question in terms of just two alternatives, the so-called armed struggle on the one hand and the parliamentary road on the other. Both are equally false. The fatal limitations of the armed struggle, separate from the mass revolutionary movement of the proletariat, was shown by the failure of the provisional IRA campaign to achieve its central aims after three decades. Today, after 3,000 deaths, the unification of Ireland is further off than at any other time. And the former advocates of the armed struggle, without a word of explanation, have exchanged the armalite and the bomb for a ministerial portfolio, which they are unable to make use of because the unionist veto is still solidly in place. Experience has exposed the policies of the reformists as hopelessly inadequate. The reformist organizations, including Sinn Féin, provide no alternative to the workers and youth who are looking for a fundamental change in society. Only the ideas and program of revolutionary Marxism can offer a serious alternative. In Ireland, in Britain, and all over the world, a new generation is beginning to move into action. It is looking for a banner, a program and, I and an idea. They are repelled by the class collaboration policies of the reformist leaders and are increasingly revolutionary in outlook. To this new generation, the ideas of Marx, Lenin, Trotsky, and above all, James Connolly, offer the only real guide and compass that they will need in order to find their way to the road that leads to socialism. It is to the memory of Connolly that great revolutionary and martyr of the working class, and to the revolutionary workers and youth of Ireland, who are destined to take up his banner, that this book and this meeting are dedicated. Comrades, I wish you every success in your tireless work to bring about the only real solution to the problems facing the working class, the socialist revolution in Ireland, Britain, and the whole world. Long live the ideas and program of James Connolly. Long live the international socialist revolution. Workers of the world, unite. So although it's not been possible for Alan to join us, we do have here another Ben, Ben Curry, um, who is the author of the introduction to this new edition of the book. Ben is on the editorial board of Marxist.com and the In Defense of Marxism magazine, and is an activist, a political activist with the international Marxist tendency. Now this meeting is hosted also, as you can see, by Well Read Books. Well Read Books is the publishing house of the International Marxist Tendency, which has outlets then all over the world, including in Britain, where we have Well Read Books Britain, which sells the books published by Well Read uh, internationally. Well Read has ambitions to become the foremost publisher of Marxist theory uh, in Britain and indeed in the world. That is not an academic exercise for us. Marxist theory is a weapon with which we can intervene in the class struggle and that is the task that Well Read Books sets itself. So with no uh, further ado, Ben. 
Yeah, um, well, apologies if, uh, if you were expecting Alan. Uh, obviously, I'm not, uh, I'm not Alan Woods. Um, and uh, actually, the, the, it, it just struck me that it's a coincidence that the, uh, the year that this book came out, originally the first edition, 2005, I was 18, and it was the, the, I was a, a neophyte Marxist, if you like. I was, it, was, it was the year that I joined the International Marxist Tendency. And uh, um, this book was really important, actually, for my education. Uh, it, education, of course, in Irish revolutionary history, uh, on the national question more broadly, and in Marxist theory, the application of dialectical materialism to the historical process more generally. This was an important part of my education, so it's, uh, it's with great pleasure that I'm you know, 18 years later or 15 years later or whatever, um, able to, to, to stand up here and recommend this book to you. Uh, you may be new to Marxist ideas, you may be uh, many years uh, experienced a seasoned uh, revolutionary, but uh, I recommend this book to you. Uh, I highly recommend this book to you. And it comes, of course, at a, a, an incredibly uh, interesting time in, in world history. We are living through a period of incredible uh, crisis of the capitalist system. The, th this system is lurching from one crisis to the next. Um, it's, and, and as it lurches from one, one crisis to the next, it's, it's shaking up the consciousness of millions of people, as Alan mentioned in his, uh, in his, his address to this, uh, this meeting. Um, and millions of people are looking for new ideas. And in this context, of course, Britain you know, stable, conservative Britain, which was always, uh, n nothing really happened in, in Britain, has become the eye of the storm in many respects. It's one of the most unstable capitalist countries in the world. It's the oldest capitalist nation, and uh, it's also now probably the most senile in its decay. Uh, it's, it's going from one crisis to the next. You know, ever since 2014, the Scottish independence referendum, and now the, the question of independence is, uh, is again in the news, it's been one crisis after another. It's been one thing after another. And of course, what is happening here is also, as well as the whole world crisis, is have, having a big impact in Ireland. You can't separate the situation from Ireland from the world situation, the world crisis of capitalism. Uh, they, are, they are intimately linked. And um, of course, Ireland is, it, it, it was uh, uh, Britain's oldest colony, and it's one of its last colonies. Of course, uh, six uh, counties within Ireland remain part of the United Kingdom. They remain a colonial possession of Britain. Um, and uh, this, this, this deep crisis is bringing to the fore all of the contradictions which they've papered over in past decades. With things like the Good Friday Agreement, they haven't fundamentally solved the deep underlying contradictions of the national question, of sectarianism, and of the class question, which is fundamentally coming to the fore. Massive class anger is building up. Polarization is developing. And uh, th these questions are being posed. The question is being posed before humanity generally of socialism or barbarism, and you can see the elements of that in the situation. And of course, the, 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 uh, the, the, the question of the socialist revolution in Ireland has always been connected to the national question throughout its history. And uh, to answer this question, how can we bury imperialism, bury capitalism, we have to study history. We have to learn from the lessons of history. We have to uh, uh, have an honest assessment of history, however hard that can be sometimes. Um, and uh, look back upon uh, the, the victories and the defeats of the past um, and draw the lessons. Now, Ireland, of course, has a, a, the, the national question in Ireland has a very long history. 800 years ago, the, uh, the, the British colonization of, of, of Ireland started, and uh, it was the country in which really British imperialism pioneered all of its methods of colonial exploitation and oppression. Uh, it, it, of course, the, the, the colonization of Ireland involved robbing the land from the people, but more than that, it involved uh, robbing people's right to practice their religion, uh, robbing them of their language, culture, and, and, and all of these things to a large extent. Stoking religious sectarianism, the, the methods of divide and rule that would be applied across one third of the Earth's uh, surface under the British Empire, they were pioneered in Ireland. Um, and, and of course, in the 20th century, you have partition, which would be applied to other British colonies being applied to Ireland as well. Uh, India, of course, in the 1940s, um, was, was partitioned with millions of deaths, but it was, it was, it was pioneered earlier than that, decades earlier in Ireland. Um, now to understand the, uh, the, the, the persistence of the, of the national struggle in Ireland, we have to understand that the, uh, the, the national struggle has, has well, the na national oppression of Ireland was not simply the imposition of foreign political rule, of British political rule. Uh, with the British conquest came the imposition of a new set of property relations. Feudal and capitalist property relations were brought to, uh, to Ireland 
uh, by British imperialism. And therefore, the struggle for national liberation has always been a struggle against that socio-economic system upon which imperialism rests. The class struggle and the national struggle have always been intimately linked in Irish history. And this was something that was understood by the, uh, the, the, those who laid down really the tradition of republicanism, which goes back to 1798, the United Irishmen Rising, under great leaders like Wolfe Tone, inspired by events like the, 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 the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the democratic ideals of these revolutions. And in fact, all revolutionary history in Ireland has been connected to the world revolution, revolutionary movements around the world. And uh, there, for the first time, despite the attempts of British imperialism to divide uh, the people along the lines of religion. You had unity between Catholics and Protestants, uh, class unity. Overwhelmingly, it was the poor, the farmers, the small craftsmen, the laborers that made up the rank and file. Um, and the leaders of the United Irishmen understood that there was a connection between the class struggle and the national struggle. Wolf Tone himself, in famous words that you may well have heard, he said that if the men of property will not support us, then they must fall. Our strength shall come from that great and respectable class the men of no property. And this is the key lesson, that, that the thread really throughout this book by, by Alan Woods, that the, uh, the, the class struggle is central to the question of national liberation in Ireland. And by, by studying that, that long history, centuries, not just of, 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 of colonial oppression and domination, but of, but of revolutionary struggle, one lesson comes to us inescapably uh, through this book. And that is that complete national liberation and freedom is in, in Ireland um, and uh, uh, all uh, all nations indeed oppressed by imperialism can only be achieved under working class leadership in the struggle for socialism, in the fight for a socialist republic in Ireland. Now, why is, why is that? I mean, that's, uh, you know, it's a bit of a, why can't we have a complete free national independence and, and uh, complete freedom on the basis of, of capitalism? Well, uh, the reason for that is that the, the national, connect, the capitalist class in Ireland since its inception, since capitalism was brought to Ireland with the British conquest, the, the Irish capitalist class uh, has always formed merely a cog in the greater machine of uh, a foreign imperialism, and specifically British imperialism. Um, in, in the 19th century, uh, um, Irish capital was unable to really compete against British manufactured goods. Um, it's, uh, the Irish capital was stored in British banks from which it flowed out of Ireland into Britain and the rest of the, the empire. Um, leaving Ireland in a state of underdevelopment. And um, um, of course, the wealthier capitalists in Ireland, whilst it was a, a, a part of, uh, a, a, whilst it was occupied by Britain, uh, looked towards the, uh, the British Empire as the main marketplace, basically, for their goods. And they always, therefore, had that attachment to the British Empire. So that connection between Britain and Ireland has always been a source of backwardness for Irish capitalism and has made the, uh, the Irish capitalist class economically dependent upon imperialism. And that's as true for the South today, which has nominal independence. It's only that the, the, the specific imperialist power has changed. It's American capital, uh, you know, the big tech companies that are now uh, uh, going bust because, or, or, or in dire straits because of this tech boom uh, going south, this speculative bubble. Uh, and, and now, of course, it's, it's Irish workers that are paying the price for that. It's uh, fundamentally, the point is, how can a class which is economically dependent upon imperialism wage a consistent political struggle against imperialism? They cannot. That is the, the, the key point of, uh, of, of Irish history. And um, by the dawn of the 20th century, there was another reason that the Irish uh, middle classes, uh, who, who for, throughout most of the history have actually risen to become the, the leaders of the, the national liberation movement, why, the, uh, why the, the, the bourgeois and petty bourgeois recoiled in fright from the prospect of, of, uh, of really raising the, uh, the, the, the whole nation, all of the oppressed masses in a fight against imperialism. And that was the, the fact that in the early 20th century, you saw the rise of a revolutionary, militant, working class movement. Revolutionary Marxist like James uh, Connolly, whose name you will hear uh, many times tonight, uh, for good reason. And people like Jim Larkin, uh, uh, big Jim Larkin, who was originally from Liverpool, in fact, uh, the, 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 uh, um, a dock worker, a trade unionist. He arrived in Belfast in 1907. And when he came to Belfast, uh, you had some of the, the, the worst conditions in the Belfast linen factories and, and within the, the working class of Belfast. Because, of course, the capitalist class knew how to divide the working class, uh, Protestants against, uh, against Catholics. 
Um, it seems like a very difficult situation to organize the workers and to fight back. But um, Larkin, under his revolutionary leadership, and this is a key lesson throughout Irish history, where have you seen sectarianism cut across? It's in the, it's in the context of class struggle. The, the, the purpose that, that sectarianism has served from the point of view of British imperialism was to divide the, uh, the working class and the oppressed. But under Larkin's leadership, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the bosses tried to use sectarianism and they failed. Uh, he united the, uh, the, the workers across the sectarian divide, bringing one section of workers out in sympathy with another. You think about the mild-mannered trade union leaders that you have in Britain and Ireland today. Larkin was as, as different as black and white compared to these people. Every spark of discontent, he would bring one section of workers out in sympathy with another. He even managed to get a layer of the police force out on strike. Uh, a remarkable feat. Actually, the only, the only reason the thing went down to defeat was because of the, the, the betrayals of the, British, uh, the, the reformist leaders of the British Trade Union, uh, the National Union of Dock Labourers. Uh, and so Larkin, actually, on the back of that defeat, he forms the Transport Workers Union, which was a very important, uh, a seminal moment in, in the history of the workers' movement in Ireland. And from there, this, under, under the class struggle leadership of people like Larkin and Connolly, um, the, uh, the class struggle uh, spread across Ireland and, and workers joined the transport union in, in their thousands. And in 1913, the, 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 uh, the workers of Dublin were increasingly beginning to organize in the, in the transport union. And this set alarm bells, of course, amongst the capitalists of Dublin, who, uh, who, who basically presented the working class of Dublin with, a, with an ultimatum, either tear up your union membership cards or face starvation. And they were led by a man called William Martin Murphy, incidentally, uh, a former nationalist MP, which shows the real division within society is a class division in actual fact. They were prepared to starve the workers of Dublin, and that's what they did. They locked them out, they brought scabs over, they, 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 uh, they, they uh, uh, let them loose against the workers as well as um, uh, members of the RIC, the Royal Irish Constabulary, who were plied with drink and then let loose on the workers. Uh, you had um, class war erupted in Dublin in 1913, and the workers in, in Britain, in cities like Liverpool, offered their, their sincerest class solidarity to their, to their brothers and sisters in Dublin who were uh, being crushed by the bosses. They offered, in fact, to welcome into their homes the children of the, the workers of Dublin who were being starved into submission by their bosses. And, you know, in that situation, the Catholic Church played an absolutely atrocious role. They denounced the, uh, the, the, the transport union for sending these children to Protestant and atheist households, uh, irreligious uh, uh, families. This, was, uh, this, this showed the real division. On the one side, the working class, the transport union, James Connolly at the head of that, and the best and most revolutionary elements in republicanism. And on the other side, the, the, the bosses, <laughs> the British state, and, uh, and the Catholic Church uh, hierarchy, the upper, the, the, at least the, the higher ups in the Catholic Church. Um, and uh, in, this, in this intense uh, episode of class struggle, you had the organization of something in, in Dublin which was completely unique in, in European history up until that time. For the first time in self-defense against the scabs and the RIC men, the, uh, the, the transport union organized uh, the first Red Army in Europe, the Irish Citizens Army. Hundreds of members recruited from the rank and file trade unionists of the transport union. Uh, this was not a conspiratorial or a guerrilla organization. This was a, a, an armed wing of the trade union movement itself, the first Red Army in European history, in fact, in 1913. So I don't think I need to uh, go any further in explaining why the, the, the big capitalists in Ireland became openly counter-revolutionary this, in this period of time. They were, they were more terrified of this than they were of, of British imperialism or anything else. They were terrified of this rising revolutionary working class movement infused with a creed of socialist republicanism um, inspired by men like, like, like Connolly and Larkin. And so when in Easter 1916, in the midst of the First World War and the blood and the carnage of that war, of that imperialist uh, uh, slaughter, a new revolutionary rising took place in, in Ireland. Um, the stance of the capitalists in Ireland whatever their political sympathies were before that, was unmistakably uh, hostile as a whole. Um, now, the, uh, the, the, the context of this, of this rising was, of course, the, the, the imperialist bloodshed of the, of the First World War, which, um, with a few noble exceptions, all of the workers' leaders across Europe had supported this, this, this horrific uh, bloodshed. The social democratic parties had all betrayed, with a few exceptions, the, the Russian party, the Serbian party, 
and the Irish uh, party led by James Connolly. They had all made, taken a stance of supporting their capitalist class. And I should note, John Redmond and the so-called Home Rule Nationalists supported British imperialism in the war and in the trenches that, uh, of, uh, in 1914. They sent the members of the National Volunteers to fight in Belgium to defend the interests of British imperialism. Um, and uh, uh, James Connolly, um, who was the, uh, uh, James Connolly, who I mentioned, took a very uh, hard stance against this imperialist war. And he could see that the choice basically before humanity was one of socialism or barbarism. And here you could see thousands of workers slaughtering each other. And now, of course, conscription was on the order of the day in, in, in Ireland itself. The, the, the prospect of tens of thousands of Irishmen being sent to slaughter socialist workers from across Europe and be slaughtered themselves. And so this gave a sense of urgency to Connolly, who saw that it was necessary to strike a blow against imperialism, to, uh, to, 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 raise, uh, to, to fight imperialism at its heart, basically, whilst British imperialism was weakened by being stretched across the European front. Um, and because, because you see, Connolly's opposition to the war, much like Lenin, he understood that in, war is, is inherent within imperialism. Um, and it's no good simply opposing war on a pacifist moral grounds. Oh, isn't war terrible? Yes, of course it's terrible. But if you're going to stop an imperialist war, you have to turn that. This, Lenin's slogan was, turn the imperialist war into a civil war. Revolution is the only way to stop this imperialist war. And Connolly understood that. Not a revolution somewhere else in Europe, but he was, he was prepared to act uh, th there and then uh, in Dublin and uh, uh, enter into, uh, basically begin the plans for an insurrection. But the citizens' army itself only numbered a few hundred members. It didn't have enough members. And therefore, Connolly uh, sought out an alliance with the petty bourgeois nationalist Irish volunteers. And, um, but he understood that, the, that this, this uh, middle class nationalist formation, um, its, uh, uh, its, its members did not have the same political outlook as the Irish Citizens' Army, which was based upon a socialist republican outlook, which was uh, uh, inspired by Marxist ideas. And he warned his own members on the, on the day that the Easter Rising uh, began. He said, hold on to your rifles. You know, he, he, he warned, first of all, that it was, it was uh, the, the likeliest outcome was, was defeat, that they were going out to be slaughtered. But he, he said, hold on to your rifles, because on the slim chances that we're victorious, uh, we are out for a socialist republic, and our allies may not go all the way. This was, uh, this, these were his, uh, his warning to his own comrades in the Citizens' Army. And he was, he was, sadly, he was proven correct about the vacillations of the middle-class leaders when on the day the Rising was due to take place, uh, which was Easter Sunday, 1916, the leader of the Irish Volunteers, Owen McNeill, sent a countermanding order, ordering the Irish Volunteers not to turn out on the day uh, for, for, uh, for uh, marches. And this massively suppressed the turnout of the volunteers, and it, it sealed the fate of the Easter Rising. It's odds, the odds were against it already, but uh, this um, successfully sealed its fate. The British used uh, a huge amount of force to, to crush the Rising. Uh, much of Dublin was, was completely shattered, uh, particularly uh, O'Connell Street. The leaders of the Rising, the commanders, were captured. And beginning on the 3rd of May 1916, in the wake of the defeat of the Rising, they were executed one after another after another in cold blood by the British Army. And um, the last of these leaders to be, to be murdered was James Connolly himself, who was still alive when um, the, uh, a newspaper called The Irish Independent, owned by William Martin Murphy, the capitalist who led the Dublin lockout uh, of the bosses, uh, on their side. Um, his newspaper, he, he published the following uh, uh, words. It said, let the worst of the ringleaders be singled out and dealt with as they deserve. So this was the national, former nationalist MP, uh, capital, you know, this was the voice of the capitalists of Ireland, basically. Um, and, and indeed, Connolly was, uh, was uh, uh, executed by the British on the 12th of May, 1916. Uh, worth, uh, Murphy got his, his wish, basically. Uh, Connolly was uh, mortally wounded at this time, he was unable to stand, and so he was strapped in a, in a courtyard of Kilmainham Jail, and he was executed by firing squad by British imperialism. And just one more footnote, I think, to the, the, the Easter Rising. Um, in the wake of the defeat of the Easter Rising, uh, the uh, British uh, government established a royal commission to investigate the causes of the Rising. And as part of that investigation, they, they interviewed a lot of people, 
Um, but one of the people, uh, one of the groups they interviewed was the Dublin Chamber of Commerce, obviously the, the mouthpiece of, of the capitalists of Dublin. And they responded that they were in no doubt as to what the cause of the primary cause of the rising was. They put it down to an excess of permissiveness on the part of the colonial authorities of Dublin Castle to what they called Larkinism in the pre-war period. In other words, they directly connected this attempt to deliver a revolutionary blow against British imperialism at the, uh, at the GPO uh, 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 in 1916 with the revolutionary wave of trade unionism of the working class in the pre-war period. And uh, they were not wrong to do so. They were not wrong to make that identification. And uh, neither were they the only ones to do so. Lenin also warmly welcomed the news of the Easter Rising. He saw it as the first crack in the ice. After, after the movement had been frozen over because of the betrayals of the, the, the labor leaders, this was the first crack in the ice which revealed a seething dis discontent amongst the working class and the oppressed peoples in Europe. Um, and indeed, the Easter Rising, I think, can correctly be understood as the, uh, the first uh, spark in that, that, that maelstrom of revolution that swept across Europe from, from Dublin in the west all the way to Petrograd in the east, with its, uh, its, its, its high point, of course, being the October Revolution of 1917. Um, it was part of a, it formed part actually of a wave of proletarian revolutions. It was part of the European wide revolutionary wave. Now um, there were two of course there were two distinct uh, tendencies within the, uh, th that took place. It wasn't just the citizens army, although the citizens army and Connolly in particular were the hard core at the center of the movement. but of course you had alongside that the Irish volunteers and there's always been different trends within republicanism representing the different, uh, the different classes within Irish society, in, in actual fact. And uh, ever since the, 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 the death of James Connolly, at least since the 1920s, the, uh, the official historians, the, uh, the, the, the representatives of capital in the south of Ireland, have done their best to really uh, completely revise history. It makes them very uncomfortable. They don't talk about the citizens' army, which of course was a proletarian militia. They don't like to talk about that. And what, to the extent that they talk about Connolly, he's elevated to a national icon, a, a national liberation hero. But the content of his thought, the Marxist content of his thought, is completely ignored. And in, in contrast to the Citizens' Army, the volunteers are, are placed to the fore in this, this retelling of history, basically. Um, but the reason the Citizens' Army, despite its numerical weakness, had such political strength was the, because of the ideas that inspired it, the Marxist uh, understanding that James Connolly brought into this movement. Um, James Connolly, who, by the way, as a Marxist, he had no contact with the other great contemporary Marxist thinkers of his time. Uh, you know, Lenin, Trotsky, Rosa Luxemburg, he had no contact with these people. And so for me, that elevates his stature even more, that he came independently to the same conclusion as many of these great revolutionary Marxists. In particular, he came to the same conclusions as Lenin on the, the national question. You see, Lenin had polemicized against many Marxists uh, uh, in, in Russia, or within the Russian Empire, who said, well, you know, we're socialists, we're internationalists, we don't want to create national boundaries and this sort of thing. We're in favor of a world socialist federation and therefore uh, we, should not, uh, we, sh we should not raise the question of self-determination for the oppressed nationalities within the Russian Empire, you know, the Lithuanians, the Poles, the Jews, all of these different groups. Uh, we just need to talk about socialism and after the socialist revolution, uh, then we will solve all of these problems. In fact, they won't need solving because we'll all be equals. And, and Lenin, uh, uh, Lenin explains that uh, behind this very internationalist sounding position, um, there stood, uh, uh, you know, opposing the nationalism of the small nationalities and the oppressed nationalities, the, there was a very real danger that the Marxists in opposing this could go to the other extreme and hiding behind an internationalist outward facade would be defending a far more reactionary, far more dangerous nationalism, the nationalism of Russian imperialism behind words about internationalism. Um, and, and it was the duty of the, the Russian Marxists in particular to defend the right of nations to self-determination. And Lenin understood that the rebellion of the, of the oppressed uh, and colonial peoples was going to be an inevitable part of the World Socialist Revolution. It wasn't going to be simply the proletariat lines up over there and the capitalists over there. You would have all sorts of national rebellions and, uh, and, and, and um, uprisings as a, as a result of the World Socialist Revolution. And Connolly understood this as well. He understood that the struggle 
for national self-determination, for independence from British imperialism, was, a, was a, a, a fundamentally a democratic struggle, um, but it was a democratic struggle that had been abdicated by the Irish capitalist class, and therefore it was necessary for the working class to take this, uh, this, this struggle, uh, which is filled with revolutionary potential, and direct it into the same stream as the World Socialist Revolution. And he raised, therefore, the slogan of a socialist republic. He was the first one to raise this slogan of a workers' republic. But he also warned, if by chance Ireland achieved a degree of independence uh, on a capitalist basis, that would still represent no independence at all. Uh, and in words which are very prescient, and don't just apply to Ireland, but apply to all the former colonial countries which have gained some sort of nominal independence, he said the following, if you remove the English army tomorrow and hoist the green flag over Dublin Castle, unless you set about the organization of the Socialist Republic, your efforts will be in vain. England will still rule you. She would rule you through her capitalists, through her landlords, through her financiers, through the whole array of commercial and individualist institutions she has planted in, our, in this country and watered with the tears of our mothers and the blood of our martyrs. So these are, these are phenomenal words. And if I can recommend, obviously I'm here to recommend you this book, uh, and start with, you know, however much you know or don't know about Irish history, start with this book, uh, you know, read it, enjoy it. It, it, it lays out the role of, of Connolly um, and uh, uh, his, his thinking within the, the context of Republican, Republicanism historically. But if you can also get hold of the, the writings of James Connolly, they're a rich treasure trove for revolutionary Marxists today. And, and I heartily recommend that you, you, you seek that out once you've read this book. Um, <laughs> So yes, uh, where was I? Um, yes, if you remove the English art, that's what I was. That's where I was. Yeah, um, those famous words. Now, the, the death of the death of Connolly um, was uh, kind of within the the Irish working class movement. It played the same role, I think, as the death of Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht played in the German Revolution. It deprived the working class of its most outstanding representatives, um, and 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 really. Um, uh, this was devastating for the outcome of the Irish Revolution, just as the death of Rosa Luxemburg was for the German Revolution. The, uh, the, 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 it's easy to say that this was a mistake, but, but Connolly didn't have the example of the Russian Revolution and the Bolshevik Party before him when he died. Um, that, was, uh, that, was, that example was to really come to life a year and a bit later. But in the absence of a Bolshevik-style party of revolutionary Marxist cadres trained in Marxist theory, um, the death of Connolly beheaded, politically beheaded, the workers' movement. There was nothing to carry on his thoughts and his ideas and deepen that thought and influence. There were people that sympathized with him, but la they lacked that organization to play that role. And the, the Easter Rising itself, the great tragedy of the Easter Rising, was that it came before the revolutionary crisis in Ireland had fully matured. That, that would really come to maturation uh, a couple of years later. In, in 1918, you had a massive general strike in Ireland, and later that year, of course, the, uh, you, had, you had a general election in which Sinn Féin swept the board. Um, and Sinn Féin was able to sweep the board because James Connolly's Labour Party stepped aside in those elections because they were, in the absence of, uh, of Connolly, the, the, the bourgeois and petty bourgeois nationalists of Sinn Féin um, basically said, to, raised the slogan, which became the slogan, really, of the revolutionary period in Ireland, Labour must wait. First, we must settle the national question, the question of independence. Labour must stand aside. Labour must wait. Labour must bite its tongue and wait until we've settled the, the question of the national question, and then we can talk about wages and, and social, socialism and all of this sort of stuff, if you like, sort of thing. And the Labour Party acquiesced to this demand. They stood aside and they handed the leadership of the whole movement to nationalists of, of Sinn Féin, which was. Uh, it was completely and utterly fatal um, because it meant that the, uh, the, the, uh, the revolutionary movement was unable to, to raise a program which could appeal to all layers of the working class on a class basis. Um, it was unable to therefore cut across the divisions which British imperialism would sow when it decided to go down the road of, of partitioning Ireland in particular. Now, I, uh, British imperialism didn't immediately want to go down the road of partitioning Ireland. They were determined to hold on to the whole island, if they, uh, the whole of Ireland, if they could do so. Um, and they had uh, they had good reason, of course, for doing their best um, to, to to try to hold on to Ireland. For, of course, economic uh, the, the economic value of this uh, of, of Ireland as a colony was was part of it. 
although it was really the northeast uh, around Belfast that represented the, the lion's share of industry and so on. But uh, we can't be crude economic determinists in, in understanding why British imperialism wanted to hold on to this colonial possession. A big part of it simply came down to geostrategical, uh, the geostrategical importance of, of Ireland and maintaining uh, a naval presence in particular off the west coast of, of Britain. And in fact, Churchill even considered invading Ireland in the Second World War. Such was the importance, as far as British imperialism was concerned, of, of having a military naval presence uh, in the country. But it was impossible. It was impossible for them to hold on to an entire country which was, uh, which was um, in rebellion uh, against them. And, so, uh, and, and they tried. They tried. They organized the, the brutalized uh, former unemployed soldiers uh, from the, the trenches of, of Europe. They organized them into notorious bands like the Black and Tans. Uh, they were let loose like mad dogs against the Irish people. But this, was, this wasn't going to fundamentally win the war for Britain. And so they realized, unable to hold on to the whole of Ireland, they went down Plan B which was partition, of course. Um, keeping hold of the industrialized north, um, uh, which is sometimes referred to as Ulster, but Ulster uh, uh, consists of nine counties. They, uh, there are only four counties in which Protestants represented in, 19, in the 1920s a majority. Uh, the reason they, they expanded that to six counties because the British could see that it was a completely artificial construct and to give it even the semblance of viability, they had to append a couple of extra counties to them. Uh, uh, increasing the number of uh, the, the Catholic population that were basically prisoners within this uh, sectarian state, and it was a sectarian state. The division of Ireland has all, uh, since, the, since the 1920s has been based upon sectarian division, the division of the working class. And I would say the converse is true, the, the reunification of Ireland will only be possible when, you, when the working class itself is united. And this division uh, which involved uh, the, the, the utmost brutality and violence. Pogroms were whipped up from 1920 onwards. Uh, you had the, uh, uh, the, uh, something like 450 people, I think, died directly in those pogroms. Thousands more were, uh, were, were, <coughs> were ejected from the factories, from the shipyards, and so on. Not just Catholics, although largely Catholics. You also had uh, so-called rotten prods, as they were referred to, uh, socialist Protestants, trade unionists, <coughs> ejected in large numbers from the factories expelled and uh, of course all sorts of institutions of, uh, of, of permanent repression against the Catholic population and discrimination in housing in jobs you had organizations like the B specials were created which really was the absorption of, uh, of the Ulster volunteers into the uh, into the state an organization that Lenin likened to the black hundreds in Russia this was a permanent cudgel over the heads of the Catholics that were imprisoned in the north uh, in this in this statelet and there was a re this, this, this whole um, method of partitioning Ireland had a, another secondary advantage from the point of view of British imperialism. It cut across what they really feared, which was Bolshevism, the rise of, re of, of revolutionary movement within the working class, which existed in embryo in potential between 1918 and 1920. Uh, it, you had a, a wave of factory occupations during the course of the Revolutionary War. Uh, where the workers occupied the factories, they raised the red flag and the creameries in the countryside. They raised the red flag and they declared them under Soviet control. They used the Russian word, Soviet. This was what the workers were inspired by, the Russian Revolution. This is the republic they were out for, a Soviet republic. Despite the lack of leadership from the labor and trade union leaders, they did this spontaneously. And not only in the south, in Belfast, in January 1919, you had an engineering strike in Belfast that went beyond, uh, that, that, that swept the entire city. It, it uh, turned into a de facto general strike across the city, which was under control for, some, for a period of time of a council of action. A Soviet by any other name was controlled Belfast in early 1919. And so this, this, these pogroms, this counter reaction, this attempt to spread division within the working class as part of the carving up of Ireland, also was aimed at undermining the revolutionary movement of the working class dividing it north and south and Protestant and between Protestants and Catholics in the north. Um, and uh, it had, of course, the most reactionary consequences and, and, and Marxists have always opposed the partition of Ireland and continue to do so. But uh, in the south as well, you had the formation of an extremely reactionary state, um, the, uh, the free state. It wasn't even a republic in name. Uh, it became a republic in name later, but it, it was a dominion under the British Empire. Uh, from the 1920s. It was, uh, and, and its parliamentarians had to pledge loyalty to uh, His Majesty King George V, his heirs and successors by law. You know, this, was the, uh, 
the kind of republic that had been, had been won. Um, a republic in which, of course, the, the southern capitalist class um, exerted their domination. It was, it was economically backward, it was dominated by the capitalist class and also the church who were brought in um, and, and, and dominated the, the country. It was, um, and it was a, a counter-revolution was then unleashed against those who opposed this treaty with British imperialism. Those who, uh, who uh, opposed the betrayal of this revolution, which is what the, the, the formation of the free state was all about. It was a betrayed revolution. Uh, the reason that they're always squeamish, the, the, the Irish capitalist class, about the centenaries that we've had in the recent period over the War of Independence, partition, and going back to the, the Easter Rising, is because they came to power on the back of a betrayed revolution. That is the basis of their power, and they're very, uh, they're very eager to hide that fact. They don't like that fact whatsoever. Um, but this, this, this reactionary backward state that dominated by the Catholic Church, this could only have the effect of repelling working class Protestants in the north, of pushing them into the hands of the unionist establishment and the state, and therefore um, solidifying partition, making the prospect of reunification, if that meant simply absorption into the south, um, absolutely repulsive to Protestant workers, and therefore pushing them into the arms of reaction as well. Uh, so despite the fact that these two states were at loggerheads, they really supported each other in the sense that uh, they, they, they pushed the masses into the, the arms of their reactionary ruling classes in both, in both uh, quarters of Ireland. Um, now, uh, as I said, uh, I, 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 uh, I, I quoted the words of James Connolly, you can raise the green flag over Dublin Castle, but Britain will still rule you. And that's very true. We see in most of the former colonial world that these countries are still dominated with imperial by imperialism on the basis of capitalism. And in fact, at least since the Second World War, here's the paradox of the situation in Ireland. At least since the Second World War, um, since which you've seen a gradual process of, of deindustrialization, just like the British capitalist class have deindustrialized uh, uh, Britain, they've deindustrialized the north of Ireland as well. And of course, with nuclear weapons, intercontinental ballistic missiles, it's somewhat lost its importance as a geostrategical point of, uh, uh, you know, um, to occupy uh, any part of Ireland, in fact. Um, and they've shown, they've shown, of course, that they can dominate uh, the South through purely economic means. Um, uh, imperialism in general, particularly, of course, these days, US imperialism, is utterly dominant over the South. And so they've had, the British imperialism has had no direct interest in holding on to the North of Ireland at least since the post-war period. And yet, they have been unable to let it go. Uh, this is the paradox, why? Why have they been unable to let it go? I think that the, uh, the answer to that is that British imperialism is a, is a prisoner to its own past uh, policies that it has applied over centuries. You can't whip up sectarianism and all of this sort of stuff for, for hundreds of years and then turn it off with, with like the flick of a switch uh, overnight. Uh, this has become a, a Frankenstein's monster. Loyalist sectarianism has become a Frankenstein's monster out of the control of British imperialism. We see how out of control it is today with the, 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 the whipping up of uh, this kind of anti-Northern Ireland protocol uh, um, uh, um, movement in the north of Ireland. The, uh, the, the crisis over Brexit, the question of the border. If, if they could reunify Ireland, get rid of the question of the border, I'm sure they would have done. But now it's even poisoning relations between Britain and America, the, the collapse of the trade deals and this sort of stuff, because of this question they can't fundamentally resolve. They are trapped by their own past policy. And uh, there's no doubt, actually, as early as the 1960s, that British imperialism was heading in the direction of, of wishing to reunify Ireland. They were putting a bit of pressure on uh, Terence O'Neill, who was the prime minister, I believe, at that time, to, to begin reforming the most uh, egregious uh, examples of, 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 of uh, oppression of the Catholics under this, this sectarian state. Um, and relations were beginning to thaw with the south of Ireland by the 60s as well. And no doubt British imperialism would have, would have tried to push that further if they could have done. But you know, the whole establishment of a sectarian state in the, in the north of Ireland, um, it wasn't going to simply be, uh, you couldn't simply get rid of it overnight. Uh, the, the, the basis of this, uh, of, this, of this sectarian rule wasn't just oppression, it was a whole web of patronage that existed, civil service jobs and, and, and discrimination in housing and jo jobs and all of that sort of stuff. And of course, any hint of reform came into immediate resistance from the old unionist establishment. Um, it's, as, uh, it's as de Tocqueville famously noted, the most dangerous moment for a bad government 
is generally that in which it sets about reform. And this is, the, this is what happened in, in the 1960s. The, the attempt, even at verbal concessions, uh, met resistance from the old unionist establishment. And the splits at the top within the unionist establishment, as is often the case when splits open up within the ruling class, the workers and the oppressed, having suffered for decades, uh, pushed themselves through those splits and divisions, and you had an upsurge in the mass movement of working class Catholic youth in the civil rights movement, inspired again by the revolutionary processes going on around the world, the civil rights movement of black people in the United States, the anti-Vietnam War movement, and above all, um, the, these young people identified themselves with the students of Paris and the, May, the events of May 68, this heroic revolutionary uh, movement in, in May 68 in France. These were young people inspired by socialist left-wing ideas who were demanding some very, very, very uh, modest things, uh, basic democratic rights for the Catholics who've been discriminated against, who were living under a one-party dictatorship basically for 50 years. That's what, it, what you had from partition up until the, the, the end of the 60s. And um, I should note that the IRA, um, it played quite a marginal uh, presence, it had quite a marginal presence at this point. Um, it played very little of a role in terms of pushing, the whole region from the late 60s now began moving in the direction of, um, of uh, civil war, in fact. Um, but the IRA had very little to do with this. This was down to the fact that the civil rights movement came into head-on collision with that Frankenstein's monster of loyalist sectarianism. The gangs whipped up by Ian Paisley, the, 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 the insane fundamentalist preacher, who whipped up uh, with a very simple message. He, he whipped up these gangs by basically saying to working class Protestants, those civil rights uh, uh, people, they want, uh, they want more jobs for Catholics and more houses for Catholics. But if we give them that, and of course, there is a logic to this on the basis of capitalism with its artificial scarcity. If we give them that, that will mean less jobs for Protestants and less houses for Protestants. It's simple arithmetic on, on, on the basis of a system which cannot provide for all. And he succeeded in, in whipping up um, a pogrom atmosphere. And alongside the Paisleyite gangs, you also had at the extreme wing, you had the, the creation of the UVF, which was indiscriminately going on a killing spree of murdering Catholics just because they were Catholics. Um, and all of this was, was creating immense pressure in working class Catholic communities. Uh, the, the, in, the pog in, in these uh, attacks against civil rights uh, marches, the, uh, the Royal Ulster Constabulary and the B Specials were, were also getting involved. They were uh, attacking these young people, uh, demanding democratic rights. And then you had an explosion. Uh, the summer of 1969, a massive explosion beginning in Derry, uh, in the Bogside area of Derry and uh, sp spreading across working class Catholic communities across the north. You had the formation of barricades. Self-defense committees were, were spontaneously formed within which there was a very definite left-wing trend. Communist ideas also had, uh, uh, get, had a certain influence. Um, there was a revolutionary potential. There was, basically you see, what do you see here? You see the same thing you do, that you do in every revolutionary situation. Revolutions are not a nice easy road to, uh, you know, uh, to a better world. You see revolution uh, uh, and the potential for revolution developing on the one hand, not just in the north, but also in the south. Um, and at the same time, counter-revolution also strengthening, polarization, and a clash between the two, which was to be decided very quickly. The whole uh, situation was moving very quickly in the, in the, the head, uh, heading in the direction of a clash, and the threat of civil war was looming, basically. And uh, as I say, yeah, the, 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 there was revolutionary potential. If there had been a leadership of the working class worthy of the name, a labor movement leadership, or if the civil rights movement uh, and, and the leadership of the Civil Rights Association had put forward a socialist program that could have appealed not just to workers in the North, but also in the South, and uh, could appeal to Catholic and Protestant workers with a class program, a socialist program, then things might have turned out differently, but that didn't exist. There was no revolutionary party with a clear program, and above all, uh, the labor leaders failed to organize what, the, what were the young people demanding at this point. There was a threat of a pogrom. They were demanding weapons to defend themselves. And the labor movement leaders completely failed to step in there with any kind of means of self-defense for these uh, young working class Catholics. Um, and uh, these were the circumstances um, in which uh, a vacuum opened up uh, and into which the provisional IRA stepped. With its, with its guns, they, were, they did have weapons, they were prepared to, uh, to hand them out for 
people to defend themselves. They grew almost automatically as a result of that. And in the rise of the provisional IRA, the, um, the capitalist class in the South and certain ministers in, the Fina, uh, in Fianna Fáil uh, played quite a fateful role. They could see this situation developing. And the capitalist class in the South were extremely concerned by this situation, the, the, the potential it had to, to, to spread a revolutionary mood within the workers also within the South. Um, and therefore, in order to offset the left-wing elements within the self-defense committees, you had the funneling of cash and weapons to the right-wing elements within those uh, self-defense committees, those elements which would later go on to form a right-wing split away uh, of, from the IRA known as the provisional IRA. You see that the, uh, the Southern capitalists were not interested in, uh, in whether or not civil war or ethnic cleansing or anything like this. That wasn't their biggest concern. Their main concern was the, the, the class content of the movement and the effect that this would have on the working class down south as well. And these, these were the circumstances in, in, in the summer of 1969 in which uh, British troops were sent onto the, the streets in the north of Ireland uh, by a Labour government, by the way, it was a Labour government which sent the, uh, the troops into to the north of Ireland, not as they declared and as many naive people uh, believed in the Labour movement on the left and within the civil rights movement, not to defend Catholics as they claimed, but to defend their own imperialist interests. They saw the potential that the whole region could descend into civil war, and they knew that that would be catastrophic for their, uh, if, if, you, if they'd allowed the situation to develop in that way, you would have had ethnic cleansing, you would have had uh, terrorism and battles on the streets, not just of, of, of cities in Ireland, but it would have very quickly spread to Britain as well. You would have, in cities like Liverpool, Glasgow, Birmingham, London, you would have had uh, mayhem, which would have been catastrophic for the interests of British imperialism. And so they, they, they went about, uh, they, they entered the street, they went onto the streets, they sent troops onto the streets. Um, not to prevent a civil war, but really to pursue a civil war along their, line, along their own uh, controlled terms, basically. Um, they, and when they went in there, they, they first of all sought to, to crush the spontaneously formed defense committees, to bring down the barricades, um, and particularly the left wing within these defense committees. And later, of course, uh, fatefully, to try and extirpate the, uh, the IRA, the provisional IRA entirely, um, which was a completely stupid, and wooden-headed policy on the part of British imperialism. Because their attempt to um, annihilate the IRA involved the complete wholesale brutalization of the Catholic nationalist population. It involved uh, policies of shoot to kill, of mass internment, of, um, of, 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 of uh, breaking homes and of a mass massive imprisonment. I think something like one in 60 nationalist men were imprisoned for IRA membership over the course of, of the two decades of the Troubles. Um, and this had the effect, of course, of driving thousands of working class young people into the, into the ranks of the provisionals. It, the, the British army and its brutalization of the, uh, uh, also via the means of, min, uh, the British state had much, many resources at its disposal, including spies and infiltrators into the, the Republican armed groups and also the loyalist paramilitaries who it used to carry out sectarian murders and whip up and fan up the flames of sectarian tension. Um, the, uh, the fact is that the, uh, the British imperialism drove the entire region in the direction of civil war with this insane and stupid policy. But now I, I should come on to the, the question of the IRA and uh, it's the, the origins of the provisionals and uh, um, their struggle. You see, I, I mentioned up until 1970, the provisional IRA re didn't really emerge until the start of 1970. It had been a marginal force of the, uh, a guerrilla struggle known as the border campaign in the 1950s, when the IRA, which goes back to the, 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 the remnants of the anti-treaty uh, IRA back in the, in, in the 20s, but um, yeah, the, the, the IRA in the 1950s um, had tried to launch a guerrilla struggle against British imperialism to try to militarily unify by guerrilla methods the North and the South of Ireland. And uh, a, a guerrilla struggle can have some effectiveness if it has a certain support amongst the population. But the, uh, this did not. This was uh, isolated from the people. And uh, its main effect, its main consequence, was, to, was, was arrests on the one hand and uh, a certain political reassessment of things on the part of the IRA leadership. Now, um, unfortunately, 
this, uh, this political reassessment, while it did lead to a shift to the left amongst the, the, the leadership of the IRA, unfortunately that didn't imply a return to the ideas of James Connolly, but rather it came under the influence of the, the Stalinists, um, who argued that basically what the IRA sh should do is focus on class questions. Very good, that's correct. But that basically it should, uh, it should seek to unite working class Protestants and Catholics in the north of Ireland um, on the basis of class issues, leaving the national question to one side and try to reform the state that, that existed in the north of Ireland. Um, in other words, to reform this unreformable sectarian state, it was a, an abandonment of revolutionary struggle effectively um, in favor of reformism and an abandonment alongside that, of course, of the weapons. Now, I don't know if this is apocryphal, but they say there was some uh, graffiti that appeared on the streets in Derry, IRA equals I ran away. Um, referring to this, uh, referring to the officials as they came to be known after the split within the IRA. Um, I don't know if this is, if, if, if uh, that graffiti ever appeared, but it certainly um, was the sentiment amongst uh, a certain layer. It was the, the feeling that they were not prepared. They were not prepared for the direction that the region was going in, which it was going in at lightning speed, by the way. Now, there were some within the, um, there were honorable exceptions to this shift in the direction of, uh, of reformism and the Stalinist influence that was developing amongst the official, official IRA, who tried to move, return the movement back to the ideas of James Connolly. People like Seamus Costello and many left-wing rank-and-file members of the officials who went on to form the Irish Republican Socialist Party. But, but uh, Costello himself was, uh, was murdered, was killed by the officials in uh, feuding, I believe, in, in 1978. Um, and uh, so th this, this this dissatisfaction with the direction in which the officials were going led to various right-wing splinters uh, from the, the IRA, which in, in the end of 1969, the start of 1970, led to the formation of the provisional IRA, the provisionals, the, uh, who had no concept of, of the class struggle and its role within the national struggle, and who viewed th things purely through a militaristic lens. And uh, whilst many of the rank and file of the provisionals, there is no doubt sincerely held socialist views and took seriously the, the verbal proclamations about being in favor of a 32 county socialist republic. The fact is that the majority of the leadership came from a right wing physical force trend. Their, their slogan was neither queen nor commissar basically. And, uh, and yet, because of course they had these connections with Southern capitalists and Irish American capitalists as well, they were able to get hold of the money and the weapons necessary to, to hand over for self-defense. But as soon as they began to grow, as they inevitably did, as the only force with the, the, the means, the physical means to defend working class Catholic communities, they soon went from the, a defensive footing onto, onto the offensive. And they applied their militaristic strategy of trying to eject British imperialism through pure military force. Um, a fundamentally mistaken policy, in fact, because uh, the fact of the matter is that um, uh, a, 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 an extremely powerful imperialist army like that of British imperialism cannot be defeated by armed struggle alone, uh, much less by a, a far smaller guerrilla force like that of the, uh, the provisional uh, IRA. Um, it had been attempted in the 1950s in the border campaign. It had failed. And now it was attempted on an even more gigantic scale by the provisional IRA, and it was, it was doomed to failure as well. And uh, uh, more than that, of course, there. They, they, they believed, and this was a misconception, this was a mistake uh, to believe this, they believed that uh, if they could cause enough economic damage, and, and the economic campaign began in the early 1970s, to the, uh, 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 um, that it, they would make it economically unviable for British imperialism to hold on to the North. So you saw a campaign of bombings of city centers and so on, um, but it fundamentally misunderstood that it was not pure economics that were, were the reason behind why British imperialism continued to maintain its hold on, on the north of Ireland. It was because the British couldn't let go because of this Frankenstein's monster of sectarianism. And um, although the ranks of the, of, uh, and, and the leadership of the provisionals were not uh, intentionally sectarian like the, the loyalist paramilitary groups, which were, uh, certainly were, of course the consequences of the campaign of the provisionals was to widen the sectarian divide. There's no doubt about that. Of course, Inevitably, in the, in the bombing campaign, you had the deaths of, of, of passers-by, tit-for-tat killings. All of this pushed a wedge into the, that, that divide that already existed and turned it into a wide open gulf. Um, the, the, it, was, it was a mistaken campaign. 
um, and it, would, it only divided the working class. And that division of the working class is the basis of the division of Ireland into two parts. There will never be an end to partition as long as the working class is divided between, uh, North, between the, 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 the Protestants and the Catholics. And um, only a socialist program can cut across that division. However realistic or unrealistic it sounds, it's only through class struggle methods with a socialist program that you're going to be able to erode the barriers of sectarianism that British imperialism has, has erected. But as I say, for the provosts um, and, and their leadership, everything revolved around militarily unifying uh, Ireland by, uh, by, by physical force. And the question of socialism, like the labor must wait policy in the 1920s, that was pushed off to believe what you want about that, uh, that was pushed off to the dim and distant future. Yeah. Um, it was a view that was completely um, contradictory to that of, of James Connolly, who explained that the cause of labor is the cause of Ireland, and the cause of Ireland is the cause of labor. They cannot be dissevered, as he famously explained. And two and a half decades of guerrilla struggle by the provisional IRA, um, this isn't a moral judgment, this is a simple statement of fact. It fundamentally did not take things a, step, a single step forward. It didn't lib liberate an inch of, of territory, <clears throat> and it didn't even bring any new concessions from British imperialism. The Good Friday Agreement, which is the agreement upon which, the basis of which the IRA uh, first uh, uh, called a ceasefire and then decommissioned its weapons and, and put everything into Sinn Féin in the political process. That agreement signed in 1998, <clears throat> the fact is that it was merely a carbon copy of the Sunningdale Agreement, which British imperialism had put on the agenda in 1973. <clears throat> I don't have time to go into the context of the Sunningdale Agreement or any of the details. I mention it only to underline the fact that two and a half decades of, of of struggle and sacrifice had not uh, wrung any new concessions from British imperialism. This is what I'm, the point I'm making. And the Good Friday Agreement didn't fundamentally solve anything. Really, all it did is pack the contradictions in ice. Um, it, uh, it didn't, it, it didn't uh, bring a peace dividend. That was the one thing that, it was, it, that, that, that was promised, that there would be an inrush of investment. For most people, there wasn't a noticeable increase in improvement in living standards. Uh, there was an anemic boom, uh, as there was in much of the world in the 1990s and early 2000s. And sectarianism didn't go away. You s far from it, in fact. It's, it's actually increased, if anything. Just like the weed of racism and bigotry in general thrives in the, in the soil of capitalism and the wants that it creates, you see that just walking around Belfast. You can see the, uh, the peace walls, or Orwellian named peace walls, as they're called, which divide Protestant and Catholic communities um, in the early 1990s, there were less than 20. Today, there's, there's, there's as many as 60, I believe. And um, uh, they've grown, not only have they grown longer and longer, but kilometers and kilometers of, of peace walls have been laid down, but uh, they've grown higher and higher. Some of them are as high as eight meters uh, tall. Um, to stop missiles and, 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 and these sort of things being thrown from one side to the other. So it hasn't solved anything. In fact, it's institutionalized sectarianism. The Good Friday Agreement has basically said, unionist parties and nationalist parties, whoever wins in these elections, whoever wins, it doesn't matter because you get the same coalition, they come together, they rule together, and they apply, they apply the policies dictated by the market, they apply austerity, they apply the, the policies dictated by British imperialism. Um, and there's, there's always a logic in the elections in, in the north of Ireland, vote for our party, otherwise the other side will get in. There's a sectarian logic to the whole setup. It's institutionalized sectarianism. Um, and within these institutions, it sounds very equal. Both sides can veto any legislation they don't like, which means the unionist parties can veto any change from the status quo. The unionist veto remains on paper. It sounds very equal. The language is very nice. It's very flowery, but it's not progress. It's, it's, it's frozen in ice uh, in 1998, and they, everything is beginning, to de is beginning to defrost now. Uh, all of those contradictions are coming back to life. The crisis of capitalism, was placed back on the agenda. Since this first book was published in 2005, we've seen the 2008 crisis, austerity, attacks upon the working class. Of course, just like racist bigots and demagogues everywhere try to use that to divide the working class, of course we see also, uh, similarly, uh, the, the, the right-wing parties of unionism like the DUP, they can't offer anything to Protestant workers, so all they can do is whip up more and more sectarianism. That's the logic of the crisis of capitalism, basically. And then, of course, we have the the, the, the real Einsteins of the Tory party have taken the border problem, which wasn't a problem up until uh, tw uh, 2016, 
uh, because Britain and, and Ireland were part of the, uh, the European Union jointly, and they've made it a problem. Uh, they've made it a big problem for themselves and everyone else uh, by, by leaving the, the European Union. And now, uh, of course, all of these questions are coming to the fore. So I'm nearly finished, because uh, <laughs> I can see the chair about to, to start kicking me. Um, and the, uh, <clears throat> uh, all of these contradictions are coming to the fore, and there is polarization to the left and to the right, and polarization over the national question. The rise of Sinn Féin North and South uh, is, 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 is um, setting, setting hopes alive that, that Irish unification could be around the corner. Um, but the point is this, They've, having abandoned the, uh, the, 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 the military struggle, having ab abandoned the arms struggle, they've now turned towards the parliamentary struggle, uh, pure parliamentarism, wrapping, uh, just massive illusions in the constitutional process um, as it exists. Um, as if anything is fundamentally solved by the, the, the constitutional process or democratic votes and so on, every uh, big question in, ultimately in history is decided by the clash of forces, not just military forces, class forces within society, uh, ultimately speaking. Um, what, what you see is Sinn Féin's uh, uh, policy is one of uh, what Marx referred to as parliamentary cretinism. Uh, they have tied themselves to this, this, this whole uh, political system at Stormont, and now they are the biggest party and they can't do anything with it because the thing has collapsed because of the unionist veto. Uh, there is nothing, the thing is ending in a dead end. And then what? That's the question. Then what? Sinn Féin's policy cannot bring a united island. Um, it seems, uh, you know, very different, chalk and cheese almost, the armed struggle and the parliamentary struggle. Um, but in fact, between an armed struggle in which vo brave volunteers conduct uh, armed combat against the state and a political struggle in which you send clever politicians into the state, despite the outward appearance of difference, neither has any place within it for the only force that can actually transform society in Ireland, the organized working class, which will own, the, the only way that uh, Ireland will, will be reunified will be on the basis of a socialist revolution that unites the working class, North and South, Protestant and Catholic. And that's the message of this book. You know, first published in 2005, it's, it's a question that's now on the agenda again, and I think it's worth, comrades, studying this. And particularly, the, the most important part comes right at the end. The best bit's always left till the end. Um, it's, uh, and I noticed that I haven't actually paid for my copy. I just popped it in my bag, so I will be the first at the back to, to buy a copy at the end of this. I've had it in my bag for a few weeks. I should have already paid for it. My apologies to the well-read comrades. Um, and the main message in the back of this book is precisely there needs to be a return to Connolly, a return to the ideas, the thoughts of James Connolly, uh, the return to Marxist ideas. Only on that basis uh, can the, 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 the lives of ordinary working class people uh, um, be, be improved and, and can we create a socialist republic in Ireland as part of a world socialist federation, as part of a worldwide socialist revolution. We as Marxists in Britain have, uh, have, have a, a, a massive duty to take an interest in the Irish national struggle. Marx was clear about that, um, it, uh, and uh, uh, we, we should be very clear about that as well. The, the Irish Revolution will be intimately connected to the Socialist Revolution in Britain, so we have a duty to pay a special interest uh, in that question. And so I recommend to you uh, this book, get your copy at the back, and, and I look forward to the, the question and answers and discussions. Thank you very much.